Um, welcome everyone. Um, we have a couple of uh, sessions for you this afternoon. And um, uh, we'll start with uh, Timo, who will talk about uh, uh, GitLab and Terraform. So uh, enjoy. Yeah, hello. Uh, today I'm here to empower everyone to manage your infrastructure using Terraform and GitLab. I'm Timo, uh, I'm a senior backend engineer at GitLab in the Configure group where we are responsible for developing ops-based, uh, ops-focused features of GitLab, for example, the configuration of infrastructure and running applications deployed via GitLab. I'm also the maintainer of the GitLab Terraform provider. I want to tell you a story. Uh, imagine you're someone with a traditional software engineering background and you want to deploy a static website for your next blog or an API backend. And for all these things, you need infrastructure. And what you could do is log in to your cloud console and manually create it there, manage it there. And frankly, if you're somewhat like me, this can be very stressful and scary because it's error prone and the, like the user interfaces aren't really intu intuitive often, especially with a software engineering background and you know, you're not really used to that. And so there's a better way we can actually do this. And I suppose I don't really need to tell you about the benefits of infrastructure as code and especially how Terraform helps you with that. However, even that we have uh, things like Terraform at our hands, it still can be kind of a problem to get started with Terraform to set up your project, um, working in a team, because ironically for all these things, you also need infrastructure. And there we have a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because if you need to store your state somewhere like an S3 bucket, like who's gonna create and manage that S3 bucket? You also need infrastructure as code somehow, store the state and there, yeah, we have a little bit of a problem. And also um, things we often want to do is share and reuse our Terraform modules and possibly uh, inside of our company firewalls. So we can't really use the public uh, HashiCorp registry for sharing our modules. And in the next half an hour, I want to um, show you how we can do all these things fairly easily using GitLab and Terraform. So concretely, what we want is we want to have a low friction, a low friction setup. It should be easy to bootstrap a new Terraform project. We should also be able to extend this easy setup or simple setup to something which is more complex, right? We want to be uh, for example, have multiple environments of, of, our, of our infrastructure. We also want confidence, and what I mean by this is if I propose a change, an infrastructure change, I actually want to be sure what it's going to look like. It may want to browse that, um, that static website I want to deploy before actually deploying it to production. And last but not least, we also want to be able to easily reuse our Terraform modules. All right, let's start with some very basic fundamentals. So let's imagine that we have our infrastructure, which is a random pet. So that's our infrastructure we're gonna manage and you will see this uh, throughout this talk in one of the, or the other variation. So here, we're gonna create this random pet with a length of two. It's just giving you like, you know, two random names for your pet or words for your pet name. And then we have an output, which is uh, this pet name. All right, and if you have um, an infra uh, uh, infrastructure as code, like the one we had before, uh, the first thing you do is run a Terraform in it, which just downloads all the providers you need, the modules, and you're ready for a Terraform apply, which shows you a plan and you can review this, you can accept this, and it gives you like a little um, output of how many resources have been added, changed, and destroyed, and these kind of things. And then, by default, our sta state ends up and is recorded in a state file, which is this Terraform TF state file you see there. And if you look at this, it's just a very simple JSON file. And we can see there our um, resource, the random pet name, and we can also see the output. And if you're getting serious with this, this is not truly enough because it's on our local disk. So how do we share this with our uh, teammates? And Terraform provides something for this, which are um, Terraform backends, which is just a place to basically store your state remotely. Um, GitLab provides an HTTP backend. That's what, we declare, that's what we declare here. So that's everything you need to basically tell your Terraform setup that we're gonna use a remote state and not the, the file we've seen before. 
However, to make this work, we need to configure this HTTP um, backend. So what we need is an API address. So where is it reachable? We also need an address for locking and unlocking this state. And we also need to um, authenticate with this using some credentials like a username and password, like you see there, uh, a timeout, for example, and other options like how many times to retry, what HTTP methods to use to call these endpoints. So we can configure it manually, so putting the configurations option directly in HCL there, um, but this has a few drawbacks as you can spot probably because there's a password there in clear text and you can't re really use the variables there, so it's not really what we want to do. It's also hard to share and reuse in other, in other places. Um, but we, we can even, uh, we can also configure it outside of the HCL file Basically, when we run Terraform in it, we can specify all the configurations we need there. So as you can see, we can sort them in like nth variables and then run a Terraform uh, in it and then the backend is connected. But even with this, um, it's quite some work to set up and we don't really want to do this for every new project. We don't want to reinvent this wheel. And also, if you're thinking about going to CICD, like how is that going to look like? And good news is, is that we don't really have to do this because in GitLab what you have are CICT templates, which is a way to basically um, get some predefined jobs you, you, um, for you depending on the project type you have. So let's look at how a CICT template looks like. So if you have a CI file, GitLab CI YAML file, you can just do this include basically and there's a, a bunch of these templates. This one here is called Terraform Latest GitLab CI. And if you do this, just this in your file, you will get a pipeline which looks roughly like this. So you have a validate um, stage which does some format checks. You also have a static code analysis um, job which is this kicks ISC um, job. And we also have a build step which runs the Terraform plan and the deploy step which runs a Terraform apply. And what this does in the end is, of course, with the Terraform apply, we get our infrastructure. You remember this random pet? That's what is illustrated here, there, basically. And this state is being recorded in the Terraform state, and by default, it's called default. It's related to a GitLab environment, which basically has an audit trail of the deployments you make to this environment, which is also called default. All right, um, let's make a quick demo of this. Okay, I'm not sure if I can hold this at the same time, but let's try. Um, so let's create a new project and call this something like TF Talk Demo. Make it public. All right, lucky enough we have Wi-Fi here, that's cool. And we have an almost empty project, thank you, Michael. Okay, <laughs> so um, let's open the web IDE here. And the first thing we can do is add our Terraform configuration. So this is, we just call it main TF, doesn't really matter what it is, it's just a Terraform module anyway. So first thing we do is we declare our backend which is this empty HTTP backend. I promise you that we don't really have to, have to configure this. So let's leave it at this, and then also our super fancy infrastructure here. Oops, with the length of two here, and we also define our pet name output. And this random pet name is in this ID attribute. All right, so now let's do this pipeline and just include our template. All right, um, that's actually everything you need to do. However, to speed up things in the pipeline, I'm going to disable this um, static code analysis job. It takes, a, it takes a while, so let's just do this. Uh, you don't really need to uh, note this, so let's call this uh, initial demo, commit it. 
Cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we see a pipeline has been created and hopefully we get the jobs we need. Exactly. So we are missing the job I uh, deliberately excluded, but we have everything else. So we have the validate uh, job, which is some format checks. Um, we have the build, which runs the plan and the deploy. And one thing which is important to note here is that the Terraform plan command in the build job, it produces a Terraform cache file, which is passed on to the deploy job. And it's using a job artifact for this. The downside of this at the moment is that they, these are public, so everyone who has access to your project can read this um, TF cache file. And in this TF cache file, we have the state in raw. So if you have sensitive information in, in there, you need to be careful who can see your project. So if you're an open source project, it can be, it can be a problem. The deploy job is manual by default, so we can go ahead and run this. We can also first look into what the plan looks like. So we see a normal Terraform output here um, with our random pet resource and the pet name output. So let's run this. And in the slide before, you've seen that there's GitLab environments and the Terraform state. So let's look at what this actually is. So here in the deployments, um, navigation point and the environments, we see this default environment. And it's currently in running, which means that something is being deployed at the moment. We also have some, um, some references to who triggered this and what job from which branch and which commit. And we already see that this uh, successfully um, passed. So if you look at uh, this environment in detail, we see every deployment uh, on these lines. So we have some auditability, who deployed when, to that environment. We also have the Terraform states here. So again, it's called default. Uh, we have the pipeline here associated and we, we can have here some useful actions we can do. For example, locking and unlocking the state. And this is especially useful if, for example, your job timeouted for some reason or it was canceled, then often your lock is still there on the state, which, need, you, then, which you then need to manually unlock. So it would look something like this after the job has been canceled. And often you want to go in and actually unlock this manually so you can run other pipelines afterwards. And another uh, thing which is also useful to know is that you can copy and paste such a uh, Terraform init command which connects, if you run this locally in your terminal, it connects to the state in Terraform. You just have to plug in your GitLab access token here, but everything else is, uh, should work. All right, let's go back to the slides here. Let's see if we can make this a full screen. Cool, <clears throat> uh, we've seen this, I'm, I'm gonna skip those. Those are backup things. So with that, we have a, I would say, rather low friction setup. So we can pretty easily set up our project and already have a state and deploy something using CI CD. But now we want to extend it to something which is more complex, right? Something which you would rather encounter uh, in your own use case. And first start with some very basic things, um, like customizing the pipeline. We've seen that the state name is called default by default, but that's not really a good name. So we can give it a name by setting this TF state name variable, for example, to production, and then our state and the environment is called production. And usually we also don't have our Terraform files in the root of our project, which is the default. Uh, we can specify it using this TF root variable, and in this case, it, all the Terraform files or the first module you call will be in the Terraform directory. What's also a very common use case is that you need to extend the existing jobs. For example, you want to um, set up Vault to pass the Vault token to the provider, to the Vault provider you use in your Terraform. And Vault is not a tool that co just comes with um, with these templates because not everyone is using Vault. But we can easily do this by overriding the jobs that come from the, from the template. So in this case, we override the build and the deploy jobs and just specify this before script um, key and use a hidden job using um, some YAML anchor magic. So we just do this to keep things dry and not basically use it in the build and the deploy job because they need the same Vault authentication. 
and, and in, the, in the job or in this hidden vault out uh, block there, we're just gonna install vault, set the vault address, and get the vault token. Something which is also often required is that you want to have multiple environments. And one way, and there's many ways how you can do this, but one way here I'm showing you is that you can define multiple jobs. Here in this case, a staging and the production job. And the production is only special in that it's only run for the default branch of your project. And the staging is run for every other branch. And how this works is that also to not repeat ourselves is that we extend from a hidden environment uh, job template and configure it using an environment variable which contains the name staging or production respectively. So how this hidden job looks like is that we can configure it using this environment variable which we specified in the staging and production job there and then use it for the TF state name and also for the file name um, where we configure basically the environment. So we still have one Terraform module in there, but we use two different sets of Terraform variables to configure them. And what's actually happening in this job is that we trigger a child pipeline with the exact same template we've been using be before. So you see there the include template Terraform latest, which is what is ran. So for staging and production, we have for each a separate pipeline, um, running all the things we've seen before. So if you look at this schema again that we've seen before, let's imagine for the staging environment we have a pet name length of three and one of two. So that's what you see, what you see there, two times the infrastructure because we had two pipelines running. We also have two different states which are um, independent of each other and also two environments. So I think with these kind of tools, you can extend the pipeline quite far to your own use case. So I would say we have an, ex an extensible uh, setup to one that can be quite complex in the end. All right, about confidence. So often, as I said in the introduction, we want to be confident before we make any change or uh, merge it to our default branch. And we offer a few features which help you with that. And one is this multiple environments you've seen before. So you can have multiple states, multiple environments, and you can provision one of them, review it, and then basically apply it to the other environment. We also have review apps, which is just basically an ephemeral environment. So it's created during a merge request, for example. You can review it there, and afterward, when, afterwards when it's merged, it's being destroyed again. There's also a Terraform merge request widget, which, show, which shows a summary of Terraform in your merge request so that you immediately see in a number, for example, that the production has a destroy in the plan, which is maybe not what you required, and then you can, we can act on this. There's also a static code analysis report, which you can easily and nicely browse. Um, which came out from this Kix job we've disabled, you remember in the, in the example before. And of course, running tests against the ephemeral environment, for example, there's multiple options. You can just run curl against, for example, an API endpoint and see if it works. That's very simple. But you can also use other tools like TerraTest to, to achieve this. So again, let's make a short demo of um, how we can collaborate in a merge request. <clears throat> And here I set up a project um, already because it, it takes a while, it's a little bit more complex, but I'm gonna walk you through it, what we do here and what we can use uh, to be more confident in, in the changes when they're proposed. But the first thing I want to show you is what the production environment looks like. And we can go to the environments here and we see one production and we can open a URL here where we have a very basic static website which requires some infrastructure and then our like random pet name which in here is this climbing dog. Okay, so let's see what's, what's going on in the project here. So we have a Terraform directory, which is not too complex, actually. Um, we have two variables. One is the environment name. We use this to produce URLs. And we also have a pet name length, where this is where both the environments um, are different from each other. 
and we have a module which we're going to use and we will talk about modules a little bit later in detail but here we're using one that is deployed to a GitLab infrastructure registry and we configured it using, using the, the inputs we have and we also have a few outputs and I told you that um, only this, this variable is where these two environments um, are different and we use this TFR files for, uh, for the environment. So for the production one, as you can see here in the file name, we hard coded the environment name to be production and also the path name length to be two. And for the review environment, we don't have an environment name because it's ephemeral and based on the branches because we don't want things to collide. And we, we define the path name length to five just because we need a difference. All right. Um, the pipeline also looks a little bit different and it's just in the end a choice you have to make what approach you're going to use. The approach with the child pipeline basically has the, the downside that you're doing things twice which you don't have to do twice like formatting the Terraform code it's always the same. Um, do the, the static code analysis we can basically only do this once. And what I didn't tell you is that the Terraform template we've used before is actually itself based on a template, but it only contains jobs. So it's not a fully runnable pipeline. And the jobs are actually coming from here and we can reuse them using extents, for example. So the .terraform format is defined in this template and we can just extend the job when we need it. So we have two sets of jobs that do the actual work. We have the ones prefixed with um, or postfixed with production, which are for the production environment and only, for example, the, the deploy for the production is only being run on the default branch, but not on any review branch. But the planning is run on the review branch as well because we want to see how the change would affect the production environment, even on merge requests. And then for the review jobs, we also have the build, which is the plan thing, and it, those are only run on branches which start with a, a, a review um, a prefix. But this is like up to you what you do there. You can have any rule you want. Uh, this was just the easiest for me to, to test here. Um, but yeah, you can, you can also run it on any other branch than, than the default branch. And we also do a little test here. It's, it's a very simple one because we're just calling curl from the URL that is output by, by Terraform. And then in the end, we're gonna destroy the environment. Again, because it's ephemeral and we don't need it anymore. All right, so if someone actually makes a contribution to this, they usually create a merge request. And I have one prepared here, which just changes the pet name length of the review environment to three. So, we can quickly look at the pipeline here. Again, we have this, this uh, basic steps like the format checking and the static code ana analyzer, analyzer, static code analyzer. Um, and then we have two build jobs, one for production and one for review because we want to plan both environments. And then we have a deploy to the review environment because we want to deploy it, we want to see what's going on in there. We run it, verify, which does the curl command to test if it's actually up and running. And the cleanup, which is not run here because it's a manual job and we have to, we have to actually manually stop it. Okay, so what is presented here quite nicely is that we actually have a review app with a URL. So we can click it and we can check the, um, the review app that has been deployed um, kind of life. So this could be an API as well. This could be anything you can actually reach, right? So in this case, we have an obviously firm Dodo. And yeah, this environment has been uh, produced um, by the Terraform apply commands. And as, just, as I told you, there is also um, a merge request widget. And that's what you see here. So we see that two Terraform reports have been generated from the pipeline. 
and one is the build production where we could see like what changed in production and it's no surprise that actually nothing changed because we didn't affect or didn't want to affect and it didn't affect the production environment but this is usually a good indicator which you should look at before merging something it's just a number but sometimes it already helps a lot to not accidentally destroy something we also have a security report here, the, the, the um, static code analysis report. We can open this here and we'll get to a little dashboard here. We have a few critical things, which is just because the S3 bucket is um, publicly readable, which is considered a critical issue. And we also have a few informational um, things like uh, the, description, uh, the, the input variables don't have descriptions and the output variables don't have descriptions. And these, thing, these um, reports are actually not only visible in the, uh, in, in the merge request, but you can also see them in the vulnerability report when you can actually, where you can actually try the, uh, these reports. So you can go here and, and mark one and then you know, do something with it. Okay. So let's move back to the slides here. Um, one thing we also have to think about is who has access to the state because um, in a default project and, and it's not change uh, configurable right now in, in GitLab is that all maintainers have read, write, lock and unlock permissions on all the states and developers only have read, state, read permissions but also on all the states and today there's no way to configure this and a common workaround people do is that they have state-only projects which control the access to a Terraform state. So you would have a separate project where you create the state and where certain people are the member of these. And you can easily use the template to also achieve this. What you have to do is set this uh, TF state address there and point it to the project you have the state in. There's an open issue actually to um, introduce protected Terraform states which is similar, or we expect it to be similar, like, uh, like protected branches, protected tags, and environments where you can find granular, specify who has access to which, um, to which state and which methods. So if you're interested in this, uh, go in there and, and comment and, and let us know what you, what you require. All right, I think with these tools I've shown in, in the merge request, we, have, we can gain some confidence about the changes we do and actually um, merge that hopefully so that nothing breaks. Okay, let's talk about re reusability a bit. So usually we want to reuse our Terraform modules. We want to separate things and we want to reuse them in other projects or in the same projects and in different environments. And yeah, we can, we can share these modules. So let's quickly um, get on the same page where the module actually is because I've been asked this question a lot recently actually and a Terraform module is a set of Terraform configuration files in a single directory that's straight out from the Terraform documentation so any directory containing Terraform files is considered a module there's nothing special about this so if you have a directory like here pet site it has some Terraform files it is a Terraform module and we can use this Terraform module using this module block there. So you see it, it has a source argument where you can point it to a local path. And we see here that we have two environments, production and uh, staging, and both refer to the same module. The problem with this a little bit is that you can't really version it. Like you would have to copy and paste it or point it to some um, other Git remote or whatever. So what we want to do is we want to actually deploy our Terraform modules to a registry. And if we deploy it to a registry, we can use it the same way. We've already seen this in the other example before in the merge request one, that you can just point it to um, another registry. Usually you have, some, you have the, the HashiCorp registry, but you can also use the one from GitLab. And then you can use the, the usual version constraints, which um, are the same with uh, providers as well. And if you want to deploy um, such a module. It's also pretty easy because we have a template for this as well. It's called Terraform module. Um, note that there's a dash module after Terraform, so that's where they differ. And there's a few variables you can use to configure 
um, you can configure the module itself. So here, these are the defaults, but you can use all of this to configure it. Maybe what's interesting here as well is the system, which is often not clear. It's just a way to say which infrastructure it targets, like AWS or GCP or whatever. And yeah, it generates a pipeline, looks like this. It does a Terraform format on your Terraform module and then deploys it if you have a tag. Let's also quickly look at how this looks like in, in GitLab. <clears throat> so I have a project here with a Terraform module. It's in here, it's the, the pet site, the one we actually used before in the example. And then here the, the template. And what's actually to mention here is that this template is quite new, so it's only been uh, on gitlab.com so far and will be in the next 59 release. Okay, so let's quickly search a pipeline which deploys something. So we actually, one thing also to mention is that we also have the static code analysis on all the branches. We don't have them for, for tags, but for a tag we have this deploy job, which deploys to the registry. And the registry is easily browsable. You just go project to this infrastructure registry tab here, and then you have here all the versions of your module um, accessible. You can click one, and it will give you some metadata about it, like when it was deployed, um, from where, and so on, and also how you, can, how you can use it yourself. What's also interesting to know here is that Sometimes if your project or your registry is private, you need to authenticate with it. And there is this credentials block you can have in your, um, in your Terraform configuration. And the good thing is that if you're using the Terraform latest GitLab CI template as well, if, you're, if the author of the pipeline has access to both projects, this is set up automatically. So you don't need to exchange any tokens or anything. And there's multiple ways you can do this. You can either share the groups with each other or you can make the, the people basically members of both projects. Okay, this also gives us uh, the reuse, reusability we usually want. We can uh, easily deploy modules to the infrastructure registry in GitLab and we can easily use them. All right, one more thing because before I wrap up, and that's the um, I want to introduce you to the GitLab Terraform provider, which is something a lot of people don't know about, but it's actually quite handy. And what you can, you, you can specify or include it like any other provider. You can configure it using a base URL and a token. So the default uh, base URL is gitlab.com, but if you have a self-managed instance, you just um, point it to there and specify a token. We have about 70 resources and 40 data sources you can use. And I want to show you a few popular use cases we have just to give you some idea what you can do with it. So one thing a lot of people do is user onboarding, meaning that if you have new users, you want to add them to specific groups and projects and whatnot. And we have in the simples or yeah, easiest case, you have them hard-coded using like a GitLab uh, user resource, a GitLab group membership to add this user then to a group. There's also linking resources for LDAP and SAML and these kind of things. What also a lot of especially companies do which are regulated is they want to have a compliant group and project setting. So they want every project to look exactly the same and have some guardrails there. So for example, have the same protected branches, tags and environments, have the same uh, like permissions, approval rules, code owner settings, integrations to the team Slack channel, for example, standard CICD variables or issue boards uh, the, the, the team needs for their agile workflow or whatever they use. You can also manage the GitLab instance itself using the provider, so you can change the application settings, you can change the topics and manage the topics, and you can also define system hooks, for example, to send out events whenever something happens on the instance. One thing which is also super useful and often used is the GitLab runner resource, which you can use to register a new runner to a group or a project. And then last but not least, you can manage the GitLab agent for Kubernetes. 
So if you have a project, you can use the GitLab cluster agent resource and the cluster agent, re, uh, cluster agent token resource to create a token for a cluster. And then for example, use the Helm release a resource to deploy the GitLab agent um, as a Helm chart to your cluster. All right, that's it from me, thank you. I think we still have some time for questions, so if you have any. I have a question. Um, I have a question. Uh, so we tried doing this in the past, and uh, one of the uh, challenges we ran into is that uh, if you make significant changes to your Terraform code in a branch, um, you want to plan it before you merge it, then potentially it works well in the branch, and then you plan it and merge it, and then it doesn't work well anymore because it's merged with Autocrat. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there, it's a common problem actually, and what you can do is you can uh, enable linear history so that you can merge stuff which is not um, in a linear history. So if some, something is merged before, you have to rebase first, run it, and then you can merge it. So that's one way you can achieve this. I think you can also use merge trains probably to solve this. Um, yeah. Any other question? All right, thank you.